Thanks, Dr. Goldenberg. We'll be talking about uh, introducing azoospermia from a clinical setting today, going through the mechanisms of pathology, and then discussing the management options. So you get a page, it's early in the morning, and the emerge jock says, I have this friend. He and his wife are trying to get pregnant without any success. On exam, his testicles are small, about 10 cc's, and he did a semen analysis that shows no sperm. What should he do? Well, you can tell him that infertility affects approximately 15% of couples that uh, fail to conceive in 12 months. Male factors are responsible for 20%, and both male and female in 30 to 40%. Azosperm is defined by the World Health Organization as no spermatozoa found in the sediment of a centrifuge sample, whereas the AUA definition is no sperm at, after centrifugation at 3,000 times G for 15 minutes, then examining the pellet. It occurs in 1% of the general population and 15% amongst infertile males. So the Merchock asks, where do we go from here? Well, you start off by taking a history for associated conditions such as varicoceles, cryptorchidism, past infections, trauma, torsion, chemo, radiation, past fertility problems, and a family history. On examination, you want to look for testicular size if they're hypogonadal, uh, less than 15 centimeters, if they have a palpable vas bilaterally, and looking for secondary sexual characteristics. Then you're going to get a second semen analysis to confirm azospermia and get a post-ejaculate urinalysis to rule out retrograde ejaculation. Hormonal profile will be next in order, looking at FSH and LH, and sometimes testosterone and prolactin are useful. In an azospermic patient, genetic testing is also valid, looking at karyotypes for Klinefelter's 47XXY, or mixed gonadal dysgenesis, 45X, 46XY. Fish hybrid analysis for Y microdeletions, and if there's an absence of VAS bilaterally, looking for cystic fibrosis testing. So the results come back. Semen analysis confirms azospermia. FSH and LH are elevated. The testes remain small and hypogonadal. Your analysis is negative for sperm, and the genetic screen is presently pending. Looks like a case of primary hypogonadal hypogonadism, or primary failure of spermatogenesis. So let's look at regular physiology now. In a normal person, the hypothalamus produces GnRH, simulates the anterior pituitary for LH and FSH, which acts on the testicles to produce testosterone by the lytic cells and spermatogenesis. In secondary failure on the right, the, either the hypothalamus or anterior pituitary fail, and therefore there's no stimulation for the testicles. However, in primary failure, like we'll be discussing today, the problem is not with the hypothalamus or the anterior pituitary, it's a failure of response from the testicles to produce testosterone or spermatogenesis. Now this is a spectrum of a disease and the range of FSH and LH can vary between normal and high and the level of testosterone can vary between normal and low. Prolactin is usually unchanged. So if we look back to physiology, the basics for a second, we have LH that comes and simulates the lytic cells, produces testosterone. This testosterone then acts on the Sertoli cells in combination with FSH. This initiates and supports spermatogenesis with Sertoli cells, as well as <coughs> fueling the germ cells uh, for this production and, and sends a numerous amounts of regulatory factors uh, to help the process of spermatogenesis. Now, let's break up the process of spermatogenesis to external to the blood testy barrier and internal. External, you start with your, your uh, germ cell that's a spermatogonium, the, the progenitor cell. It undergoes mitosis and cell growth, uh, ending at a primary spermatocyte. FSH works here to help facilitate this point forward. It crosses the blood testy barrier during the process of meiosis to a secondary spermatocyte where testosterone acts, and finally, differentiates to spermatids, then spermatozoa. So as you can see, if it's external to the blood testy barrier, uh, these are directly um, at risk of gonadotoxins and external environmental factors. So amongst this uh, spectrum, failures with spermatogenesis can be described amongst a spectrum of four uh, histopathologic scenarios. Hyalinization, Sertoli cell only, hypospermatogenesis, and maturation arrest. 
In hyalinization, uh, it often occurs in Klinefelter's and mixed gonadal dysgenesis. Here, there is hyalinization in, and inflammatory cells around the seminiferous tubules uh, impacting the process of spermatogenesis. With Sertoli cell only, there's no germ cells present here. Hypospermatogenesis, the next progression, there are some germ cells, but not very many, and there's a very uh, low rate of spermatogenesis. Maturation arrest can be subdivided into early and late. In early, it's as if there's a uh, conveyor belt and it gets halted early on. So you only see up to spermatocytes. However, in late uh, maturation arrest, you see some of the later products, including spermatids, but no spermatozoa. Here's a study that's uh, retrospective and uh, looked at 219 men uh, with non-obstructive azoospermia. And what they found was that based on these four classifications, there's differentiating uh, functions of hormonal levels. So with FSH levels, it's the highest in the Sertoli cell only group because there's no germ cells to respond to this. It's uh, next highest in the hypospermatogenesis followed by the maturation arrest. In the, uh, the next group, genetic abnormalities are highest in the hypospermatogenesis group followed by the uh, maturation arrest. And finally, the amount of uh, sperm that can be elicited in each, each of these conditions is highest in the hypospermatogenesis, then by maturation arrest, and the lowest in Sertoli cell only. So if we look at the etiologies of uh, problems with spermatogenesis, uh, our genetic screening can identify those with genetic complications, the Y microdeletions, and the karyotype abnormalities. Associated conditions uh, can also have uh, a large hand in this process. So let's first talk about Y microdeletions. They occur in approximately 13% of non-obstructive azospermic patients. Uh, in this particular study, they looked at 78 patients with AZF deletions. They ran a PCR for 30 sequence tags in the AZF region, comprised of three different domains, AZF A, B, and C. As you can see, the white indicates the, the problematic areas. AZFC is the highest, followed by B, then A is the least common. When they looked at the rates of sperm retrieval, AZFC was the only one uh, that could potentially have any sperm retrieved, where AZF, B, and A, uh, in no studies that I've come across, have had sperm retrieval. Looking at uh, karyotype abnormalities with Klinefelter's disease, this has an incidence between 1 in 500 and 1 in 1,000 in the population. Uh, the genotype is typically a 47XXY, uh, but there is mosaics of 46XY and 47XXY. Uh, these individuals don't often present until puberty, or they have infertility later on, hypogonadism, and sometimes gynecomastia. This meta-analysis looked at the rates of sperm retrieval amongst uh, all the different papers published for <coughs> Klinefelter's disease and found on average about 50% of these individuals uh, can have sperm found on uh, microdissections. <clears throat> we shift now to mixed gonadal dysgenesis. Uh, these individuals uh, often present with ambiguous genitalia at birth or if it's more subtle, they'll present later on in life uh, with infertility and histopathologically often have hyalinized and disorganized cytoarchitecture. There's only been about four case reports that I've come across that there's been successful fertilization, and they often result in genetic abnormalities in the offspring. In this particular case, there's a ring Y chromosome, and in another case, uh, Klinefelter's uh, genotype was passed forward. If we look at the associated conditions, let's start with varicoceles. Uh, they have an incidence of about 16% in the, azos, or the infertile population and 1.6% in the azospermic population. There's been a variety of mechanisms that have been proposed and there's no definitive answer to this, but there could be several different processes underlying problems with spermatogenesis, including oxidative stress, increased temperature, uh, which also makes the oxidative stress more susceptible, 
increase venous pressures and decrease arterial pressures, as well as increase toxic metabolites um, from the venous stasis, either from the adrenal or local metabolism of the testicle. All these things result in increased germ cell apoptosis. So to perform a varicocelectomy or not, in a study of oligospermic uh, patients, a meta-analysis was performed and they didn't find a significant effect. Uh, the confidence interval of 95% uh, crossed one from 0.73 to 1.68. However, the case in azospermic patients might be a little bit different. Here, a prospective study of 27 azospermic patients treated with microsurgical varicocelectomy <coughs> found that 33% of these individuals developed sperm in the ejaculate uh, following this. However, within a six-month period, approximately 55% of these uh, became azospermic again thus indicating that there might be a window of opportunity uh, within the six months after treating a varicocelectomy to retrieve sperm. <clears throat> An additional study, a retrospective review in 2004, identified 31 men with azospermia and underwent microsurgical varicocelectomy. In this group, 22% had sperm re reported on the semen analysis. 9.6 of these in the ejaculate could be used for ICSI and uh, um, the remainder did not have enough sperm for that. However, importantly, there wasn't an increase in retrieval from uh, testicular dissection. So what this means is that in treating the varicocelectomy, those that would have had sperm found on testicular dissection um, may be benefited by having the varicocelectomy. However, in those that weren't going to have sperm in the first place, there's no additional cohort of patients that are going to respond to it and increase your numbers. I think if they're azospermic, it's probably reasonable to, to go ahead and do the rest of the testing. And, uh, and then the findings are then Yeah, I think so. <clears throat> okay, we'll shift gears to cryptoarchidism. has a prevalence of about 1 to 3%. And uh, the results on semen analysis are differential depending if it's unilateral or bilateral. In unilateral cases, 35 to 72% are normal, 20% in the oligospermic range, and <clears throat> less than 10% azospermic. Bilaterally, the results shift a little bit. Only 20% or less have normal uh, semen analysis. 20 to 30 percent have oligospermic and upwards of 40 to 75 percent have azospermia. The important thing here is that in a unilateral process there's still bilateral changes when they look at the pathology as well as the physiologic functioning of, of uh, spermatogenesis. <coughs> With infections and orchitis uh, the inflammatory cells can also cause a, a, a problem with spermatogenesis bilaterally as well, even if it's a unilateral process. In this particular study of 45 men with gonococcal urethritis or epididymal orchitis, they did a testicular biopsy. What they found was that the seminiferous tubules became necrotic and there's a huge inflammatory cell infiltrate uh, surrounding this zone. They performed semen analysis at two years out and found that 27% still had azospermia and 33% had a retained oligospermia, where the remaining 40% had uh, normal semen analysis. Looking at trauma and torsions, um, in uh, abnormal semen analysis was found in about 12 uh, or 12 years uh, following. Uh, azospermia was quite rare in this group, and oligospermia occurred in approximately 37%. Uh, and 56% they had asthenospermia, and 53% had tratozoospermia. <clears throat> the key point that they found in this group as well was that there's an abnormal spermatogenesis bilaterally, even if it was a unilateral testicular torsion. So the underlying driving mechanism that inhibits spermatogenesis occurs in both testes, not just the one. There didn't appear to be a difference in method of treatment with um, orchidopexy, and the orchidopexy itself didn't seem to decrease fertility rates uh, even more. In those patients that have a torsion beyond 24 hours, it's a little bit controversial what you would do, but if there's any sign of a viable testy, um, it's probably worth leaving it in and pexing it, 
uh, even though there's a risk of increasing the inflammatory response. <clears throat> so looking at chemotherapies briefly now, let's look back to uh, the process of spermatogenesis. And those cells that are outside the, the blood testing barrier are at direct risk for um, gonadotoxins and uh, inducing apoptosis, while the remainder are at risk of, for lack of differentiation and oxidative stress. In this uh, review article, this table summarizes it quite nicely. Uh, those agents that are alkylating uh, in mechanism are the worst for uh, creating azospermia, uh, directly attacking uh, the dividing cells. <clears throat> and uh, if you look at the bottom, there's also uh, other agents that uh, produce a transient azospermia, but they often recover. This is in chemo agents like adriamycin, uh, been blasting, etc. Uh, some of the ones that we commonly use with the cisplatin and cyclophosphamide uh, that we see, uh, these can produce prolonged azospermia. With biologics, uh, there's not a lot of evidence as they're fairly new, but tyrosine kinase inhibitors sometimes will decrease sperm counts in one study. I found in another it had normal uh, sperm counts following treatment. Interferon therapy had one case report of azospermia, and mTOR inhibitors uh, did not appear to have any literature on fertility at this point. With respect to recovery, it depends if the spermatogonial cells have been damaged or not. If they have been damaged uh, by the alkylating agents, cisplatin, etc., uh, there may be a risk that the, there's no recovery of spermatogenesis. However, if it's one of the other agents like adriamycin that briefly inhibit it, they typically stay in the literature that about 12 weeks post-chemo, you'll start to have a return of uh, sperm cells being produced. Finally, a related uh, topic with the radiotherapy, it also impairs spermatogenesis, either directly um, being toxic to the uh, sperm cells and the pro progeny cells, or um, with oxidative stress mechanisms. With uh, radiotherapy following this, it takes approximately uh, 18 weeks to have a complete depletion of the sperm. And this is driven by a process called maturation depletion. Here, you take out the progeny cells in the beginning. You still have the middle cells that continue to differentiate and produce sperm. And as this stock decreases, you do not have any younger cells coming in uh, to continue the process forward. Therefore, about 18 weeks it takes for those cells to run out, essentially. Radiotherapy is also dose dependent. Um, if you used 0.2 gray, it takes approximately 21 weeks to recover. Increase it one gray, it becomes seven months for appearance of sperm, and up to two years to reach pretreatment levels of sperm. This increases all the way up uh, when there's direct radiation to the, the testes. With 10 gray, only 15% of individuals will ever recover any level of spermatogenesis. It's also important to note that fractionated doses are more toxic to these cells than the same dosing all at once. So is there a unifying pathophysiology to all of this? Well, each of these associated conditions has its own mechanism of contributing to failure of spermatogenesis. However, there's been a lot of talk in the literature lately about oxidative stress and free radicals driving uh, the decrease in spermatogenesis. So what are free radicals? They're compounds that have an unpaired electron superoxide, superhydroxide, and these, these uh, um, substances are produced in higher amounts in pathologic conditions. Or if there's inflammatory macrophages, neutrophils that are recruited, this drives the process forward. There's, uh, these things exert their damaging effects on the cell membranes. They form covalent cross-linking uh, bonds to biologically active uh, molecules and induce uh, apoptosis. So when there is uh, one of these agents uh, in the cell, there's two ways that the cell can, can deal with it. One, there's a detoxifying route, and if the cell is equipped with uh, enzymes that can handle this, like glutathione peroxidase, superoxide dismutase, or catalase, it can take uh, these ions and reduce them down to substances that are not damaging. However, if they do not have this capability, then they become more destructive creating hydrogen peroxide, combining with copper or iron, and creating further damage to the cell membranes, DNA and RNA. 
Now, there is a differential ability between germ cells and Leydig cells and Sertoli cells uh, to deal with these radical oxygen species. Germ cells, I like to think of as a light hiker. They don't really have a lot of room to take a lot of extra stuff. So they don't have a lot of these enzymes that their bigger brother and sisters, the Sertoli cells and Leydig cells have. So therefore, their ability to detoxify is less and they're more vulnerable to oxidative stress. Let's go over briefly some of the, the uh, mechanisms of action here. So with a pathologic condition, it upregulates cytokine-induced stress kinase, downstream effect on E-selectin. This recruits neutrophils and inflammatory cells and increases the reactive oxygen species, peroxidase damage to the cellular membrane, and induces apoptosis. This is mediated through the BCL2-mediated caspase, caspase cascade, uh, which is a family of proteases that uh, cleaves different proteins and uh, notably uh, the protein that holds DNA ACE is released and the DNA ACE fractionates all the DNA fragments inducing apoptosis. This then signals the Sertoli cells to phagocytose all these apoptotic germ cells and it release, releases additional inflammatory factors, interleukins 1, 2, and nuclear factor beta kappa. So it looks like oxidative stress does have a role underlying all these mechanisms and there's been a lot of publications relating this uh, that could be a, a driving force forward uh, that will be uh, receive more attention in the future. So let's shift gears uh, to the management options now. We have to retrieve the sperm from a patient that's azospermic. Final aspiration is one option, testy biopsy, and testicular sperm extraction, uh, that I'll call TESI, and microdissection, testicular sperm extraction, microtessi. The photo here is that of uh, fine needle aspiration of sperm, and it hasn't been particularly successful in getting sperm from the testes, so we'll move forward to testicular biopsy and TESI. On the left, uh, there's percutaneous biopsy, and on the right, there's the TESI uh, procedure, which involves a transverse incision in the the testicle, the seminiferous tubules are then visualized and a biopsy is taken looking for sperm. In this particular study there was 35 consecutive patients with non-obstructive azospermia that underwent both testy and needle biopsies. <clears throat> they found that there was a higher rate of sperm retrieval in the testy group compared to the percutaneous biopsy group. 63% in the testy group uh, compared to 40 14% in the multiple needle biopsy groups. The next evolution of TESI was micro -tessi. Here, again, a transverse incision is made in the testicle under 15 to 25 power microscope. Seminiferous tubules are observed, and a large or dilated section is selected, as is thought to have sperm inside. This is retrieved, and in the OR, they look under a microscope to see if there's sperm present. Comparing these two techniques, conventional versus microtessy, this study looked at 435 men with non-obstructive azospermia. Uh, after 543 tessy um, attempts, they did the first 83 in a conventional fashion and the remaining 460 in a microdissection fashion. What they found was that 57% retrieval in the microgroup and 32% in the conventional group. Um, lending to the idea that microdissection is, is far superior. They also looked at the morbidity following the procedure. So they looked at endocrine changes and found that there wasn't a difference between the groups, but there was a mean decrease in testosterone from 310 to 250. Uh, in ultrasound findings, they looked for abnormalities found on ultrasound at three and six months, and again, the microtessy group uh, came out on top. Now, with these dissections to get sperm, there are a few ways to optimize the retrieval of sperm through uh, mechanisms to try to increase testosterone in the first two non-steroidal antiestrogens and aromatase inhibitors. And we'll talk a bit about antioxidant therapy. Non-steroidal antiestrogens, namely clomiphene, uh, block the uh, feedback to the pituitary, thus upregulating FSH and LH, increasing amount of testosterone. In a study with 42 uh, men with azospermia, they dosed clomiphene, so they reached testosterone levels between 600 and 800 nanograms per deciliter. 
Uh, by doing this, they found sperm in 64% of semen analysis after this treatment, which was a fairly positive result. All the remainder uh, individuals had successful sperm retrieval uh, on dissection. Uh, this is a very positive study and there has been other studies in the literature that have been negative. <clears throat> Aromatase inhibitors block the conversion from testosterone to estrogen and can be subclassified as steroidal or non-steroidal. In a prospective study with 140 men with <coughs> azoospermia and oligospermia, they were treated with either uh, Tesselactone or anesterazole daily, and found that the testosterone to estrogen levels uh, ratios increased in both groups respectively. The oligospermic individuals did have Im improved semen parameters with increases in motility and concentration as well as morphology. In the azospermic men, they did not develop semen or sperm in the semen, however. Uh, there is some question whether it could potentially increase the likelihood of retrieval on dissections. When we look at these agents specifically in the Kleinfelter cohort, um, <clears throat> both agents uh, in increase the amount of testosterone found in these individuals from pretreatment to post-treatment. Uh, the sperm retrieval rate in this particular study was 68% amongst all the different domains, which was somewhat higher than the literature previously at 50%. Um, this led to a pregnancy rate of 57% and a live birth rate of 45%. However, it should be identified that uh, in the group that did not receive any therapy, their success rate was actually 86%, but this group had significantly higher testosterone level pre-op compared to any of the other groups. So this is another study indicating that testosterone is, is important in uh, retrieving sperm and spermatogenesis in this cohort. If we look at antioxidant therapy, vitamin C, E, zinc, selenium, uh, coenzyme Q10, amongst others, are have been used uh, in multiple studies to see if this increases a response. In this particular study with azospermic men, 11 served as controls and 24 received uh, multivitamins, coenzyme Q10, as well as two lemons a day. Uh, what they found was that all the men receiving the treatment had some level of sperm in the semen uh, compared to none of those that were in the control group. They were followed at one, two, and three months. So this does indicate that there could be a role for antioxidant therapy in the future. Uh, however, the results have not been as robust with the oligospermic group, but have been with the azospermic group. Just like to thank Dr. Nigro and Dr. Taylor, and we'll now shift gears to Dr. Taylor's uh, portion of the talk. So, um, well, thanks for having me. I'll just, uh, I'll just take about 10 minutes and go, go through a little bit of our experience with in, in guys who have had uh, epididymal or, or testicular sperm extractions. Um, and, and that, of course, brings us to ICSI, which is what we use um, in, in, in guys who have epididymal sperm uh, retrieved. Now, ICSI's been around since 1993. And as you might know, what we do at, uh, at fertility programs like ours is we give women gonadotrophins for about 10 or 11 days. That causes them to grow multiple eggs, which we harvest transvaginally. And then we fertilize them. And you could fertilize an egg either with standard insemination, where we take one egg and we put about 50,000 or 60,000 sperm in that dish um, and wait and see what happens. Dim the lights, put the music on. Um, and, uh, and, and we get fertilization if you've got ejaculated sperm in most cases. But in, in cases like like these guys, we, we need to use ICSI. So that's the other option. I just have a little video about ICSI. ICSI has a higher um, fertilization rate than standard insemination, even if you have ejaculated and good quality sperm. And what we do with ICSI is we take a sp single sperm, it's put in this glass pipette on the right, and it's injected into the egg. Um, as you'll see here. It looks quite violent, but uh, believe it or not, this produces human beings. <laughs> So the sperm is, um, after it's immo immobilized, it's injected. And there's quite a few instances where we use it. And more and more and more we're using ICSI, um, <coughs> such that now almost two-thirds of our cases um, are ICSI. And um, some centers have gone to pure ICSI. But we'll talk about the reasons not to do that uh, going forward. So that's, that's where life begins in 2013. Dr. Usby, who I work with, um, he says that one day all babies will be produced by ICSI. And 
uh, sex will just be for fun. So if you want a baby, you'll use ICSI and you'll have sex for fun. Um, <laughs> he's a businessman, don't forget. Um, the indications for ICSI, so of course these, these guys, so the, the men who have, we have, of whose sperm we take from uh, the epididymis or testes. We've taken in all these examples that Ryan reviewed. We also have the, um, we also do it not uncommonly, including yesterday, in men who on the day of the egg retrieval are not able to produce. And uh, so, so then that's when Victor and Mark uh, come in and, and aspirate sperm for them. We always joke that nothing says relax and ejaculate like the threat of a needle going into your testes. So that's the other group that we're using that sperm on. We also do ICSI, of course, if the count is low, um, if there's low morphology. Um, as you know, it seems like everyone has low morphology, but, but it's not particularly predictive in, in natural conception, but it is in what happens in the lab. So if we see less than 4% normal, we will, we will do ICSI. Unexplained infertility of more than three years duration. Um, it speaks to sort of what's happening at a cellular level with infertility. And so there's a lot of 15% uh, of couples, we can't explain why they're not conceiving. And we wonder if it's not at the cellular level. Maybe their zona doesn't have the right proteins that allow the acrosome reaction to occur. Maybe, you know, some, some part of this, the cascade of human fertilization is not happening. So in that group, we'll also do, uh, do ICSI. If, if on a previous cycle, we've had poor fertilization or no fertilization or polyspermic fertilization, we will do ICSI in a subsequent cycle. If there's high levels of antisperm antibody, so we generally say more than 50% binding, um, would recommend ICSI. Previously frozen eggs, more and more women are now freezing their eggs for social reasons or for reasons of, ha of them being, having cancer and being exposed to gonadotoxins. Um, it's now even the lupus population are freezing eggs. And so more and more we're, we're dealing with frozen eggs and those frozen eggs have abnormal zonas and so we, we do ICSI for that population. We also do it in, these are sort of weaker indications, we do it in uh, advanced female age. That's mostly because we get very few eggs in those women. And so the few, you do want to optimize fertilization in that population. Um, endometriosis, we do more because in order to do ICSI, we strip the egg of its cumulus complex. And that cumulus complex we know in people with endometriosis is full of uh, cytokines, other inflammatory mediators that we think are, are harmful to fertilization. So we typically will do it in at least severe endometriosis now. And while not treated locally, but HIV discordance is another indication for ICSI. So we end up doing it a lot, probably a little bit too much. It's used a bit too liberally. And, and the reason we don't want to do ICSI just on everyone indiscriminately, there are some risks with it. And despite the fact that IVF's been around since the 70s and ICSI <coughs> since the early 90s, and we're looking at about a couple of, just over 2 million ICSI babies walking the earth and, and over 5 million IVF babies, it's still a little bit unclear exactly the, the magnitude and the cause of the, uh, the abnormalities we see with ICSI, but we, we, there are some risks with it. So let's go through that. So it's possible during the process, you saw that we're injecting an egg, it's possible to damage the egg. That's not common. That's less than 1% of eggs will be damaged in ICSI. Um, but what we worry about and what couples worry about with CS is sex chromosome aneuploidy, imprinting disorders, and, and congenital malformations. <coughs> Um, for as many studies that show an abnormality, there are as many studies showing not. And I think that's the limitation in, in the data that's been collected to date. Um, large population studies are done where they just look at ICSI, not necessarily tease out whether this was testicular sperm or what the situation was, whether it was a genetic, underlying genetic disorder in the male. Um, but our impression is that if ICSI is done for an indication um, sort of from if it's not epididymal sperm and we have decent sperm in the ejaculate and the indications are sort of from what's from the second one down, we don't see these increase with ICSI. But when you, we do see them if, you, if you're starting to deal with epididymal sperm um, and directly uh, biopsy testicular sperm. And so we see higher rates of sex chromosome aneuploidy um, if it's, again, if it's a severe male factor, 0.6 to 0.2% uh, that, that difference. Um, imprinting disorders like Angelman's and Beckwith-Wiedemann's are more common. Unfortunately, they're rare disorders, but um, they increase from 0.1% of the population to 0.8. Congenital malformations is, is a little more controversial. There's a suggestion in some reviews that your geni genital abnormalities are higher, cardiac, and musculoskeletal. But I think, for, again, for as many studies that say there's an abnormality, there's not. The, 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 the standard, I think the feeling in the infertility community right now is that there is an increase with ICSI probably related to the underlying diagnosis in the couple. 
it's difficult to tease it out because, of course, there's so many factors that women are, they tend to be older, they've got disease that's brought them to ICSI in the first place, and, and, along with the, the, the male partner. What we do in the office is we quote a 1% increase in uh, sex chromosome abnormalities and imprinting disorders, perhaps congenital abnormalities, in, uh, in couples who are, who are using ICSI uh, for male factor infertility. If it's not for male factor, we don't quote that. Outcomes after, this is the largest trial I could find, um, looking just at, at, again, the congenital malformation issue in specifically, specifically in, in where we've got testicular epididymal sperm. And, and this was um, a cohort from you know, the, one of the Danish databases, and uh, they did not find a, a difference, interestingly, um, if, if, he had, uh, if he used that sperm. So it's certainly reassuring. We've been looking at a couple of million babies, many large trials, including this one, of about 8,000 babies. And we're not seeing worrisome trends, but we, we still quote people. So I, I'm, I'm sort of wringing my hands a bit because a new study comes out every month saying there is an increase, and then the next one comes out saying there's not. But we do, we do use caution. We quote the, the worst case scenarios, and we quote a 1% increase from a baseline of 3%. Um, so as you know, after we get fertilization with ICSI, um, we then grow those embryos out. And we grow them out for as long as six days. Um, before they're put back into the uterus. Typically, we put them back at around the five-day window. So, and that's trying to mimic what's happening normally. Normally, fertilization occurs in the fallopian tube. The embryo hangs out for three days in the tube and then enters the uterus and implants about three or four days later. So you don't have much longer. So the future is not that extended culture of, of embryos. It's probably going to be stopping at where we are now, day five or day six. And the concern about imprinting disorders is whether it's ICSI or not, is that this long exposure in the lab may be related to imprinting. Nevertheless, um, what, the, what, what um, Dr. Nigro asked me to speak to was what sort of the next frontier is in what we're doing in the lab. And the next frontier, which is here and now to some extent, is taking these embryos and studying them so that we're putting in the best embryos into a, into a, a woman. And so what we're, the stage we're at right now in the science is we're biopsying, it was always eight, the eight cell embryo, we would take a single cell out. Now we're doing trophectoderm biopsy, so we're biopsying the blastocyst now. And that tissue is put on a FedEx jet, flown to a lab in California, or there's another one in Detroit, and they're analyzing the cells, determining the genetics of the embryo. And they're going to, when we, we do that, we can look at it for a specific disease. So the couple has Huntington's disease. We do about 10 Huntington's couples per year. So hunting, and that's on chromosome 4. So what we do is we send them off that tissue. They tell us, and then we get, say, eight embryos. We get, and, and they give us a report back that says embryos 2, 7, and 3 are, do not have Huntington's, so go ahead and transfer those, and the other ones should be discarded at the, as the couple wishes. So we're doing, pre that's called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, where we're probing for a specific gene and that's being expanded now. We're doing couples with uh, women with BRCA. So it's really, you know, there's, you can imagine the sky's the limit. We've even had a request for, to test for color blindness, um, which we declined because that's a really availed test of gender, which, we're not, which is illegal in Canada. But, um, so, uh, but we're testing for major disorders. Huntington's and CF are the big two groups we do, but again, BRCA is becoming more and more common. And that's been around for a while, you know. We do about 100 PGD, um, and that's most of what's done um, sort of west of Ontario. Um, we do, and, and, and it's, that's pre implantation genetic, um, genetic diagnosis. We've been doing it for about 10 years now. Well, what's happening now is we're now screening embryos. So, as you know, the, there's been big advancements in how we test babies to see if they have Down syndrome or not. But now we're trying to test it before implantation. So... Um, we're actually able to take that same tissue and just say, does this have an extra chromosome 21? Does it have Y chromosome microdeletion? Does it have some other chromosomal or genetic defect? So this is the, the worry about eugenics. But generally speaking, for aneuploidies, we're able to eliminate things like Down syndrome um, if, if, families, if, if families wish to. And that, I think, is really the future. And what we do now is then you can, one of the advantages of that, besides eliminating disease, is actually reducing the number, the number of times we have to put more than one embryo in. So we can just put one embryo in now because we know it's genetically perfect. Interestingly, though, even in this group where we have pre-implantation, we have done pre-implantation genetic screening, which is also called comprehensive chromosomal screening. That's the new lingo for it. Even putting in a perfect embryo into a uterus, the pregnancy rates are still not 100%. They were in the range of 85 90%. 
but uh, I think that will be the future, um, is, uh, is pre-implantation genetic screening of all embryos. Right now, it, it, it increases the cost of an IVF cycle significantly. So right now, including medications, an IVF cycle is about $10,000. If you add pre-implantation genetic screening to it, the, it's another $4,000. So a lot of people aren't doing it because it is quite expensive. But I think as more and more genetic labs become available, more people do the testing, the costs come down. I think this is probably where, where, we'll be, where we'll be heading. So that's the current state of the art. That takes us a little bit out of ICSI, but just to, um, to tell you where we're headed. Um, and I think that was all. I was going to just show you a couple of slides from the, of where ICSI's done. So this is, um, this is the ICSI station here. So um, from our lab, and uh, these are this is a, these are incubators. So after we've got embryos growing out to day threes and day fives, they sit in little wells in these uh, where we pump in oxygen and, and certain proteins and sugars. Um, and then that's a, not a great view, but that's our andrology lab. Um, it's not uh, sensitive to light like the uh, embryos are. I think we'll, we'll stop there actually because the rest were just about. The Canadian experience with IVF and ICSI benefits. All right, thank you.